You were born in crazy town. You've lived your whole life among denizens of delusion. Stuck in a culture that believes unlimited growth on a finite planet is perfectly reasonable. You've watched as they clear cut the forests, removed whole mountaintops, smothered the earth in asphalt, and most unforgivingly, ran their gas powered leaf blowers from dawn till dusk. And despite your concern, you have participated in all this. Reluctantly, perhaps, but in Crazy Town, all must participate in order to survive. You've voiced your growing skepticism that things are not quite right and headed towards obvious disaster. You've been called a romantic idealist, a primitivist hippie. Get back to work, they've said. Crazy Town needs you, and you need Crazy Town, so quit your whining. But you were not alone. There are others in Crazy Town who see what you see and share your concern. Jason Bradford, Rob Dietz, and Asher Miller have dedicated their lives trying to bring sanity to our collective confusion, and they do so with sincerity and humor. If you combine their bios and resumes, you'd learn that among them they have expertise in ecological economics, environmental science, conservation biology, and climate organizing. One is an organic farmer, and all three are dads and lovers of 80s films. They are also the executive director, program director, and board president of the Post Carbon Institute, based in Corvallis, Oregon, whose mission is to lead the transition to a more resilient, equitable, and sustainable world by providing individuals and communities with the resources needed to understand and respond to the interrelated ecological, economic, energy, and equity crises of the 21st century. Today, the next stop on our odyssey is their farmhouse attic turned podcast studio. Out their window, you can see the flax growing at full summer height, and on the horizon are a couple snow covered peaks of the Cascade Mountains. Welcome to Human Nature Odyssey, a podcast trying to find some semblance of sanity in our global civilization. I'm Alex Leth. Well, I appreciate getting to be here with you guys. It's a funny thing of like, thank you for having me, but you're hosting me physically. I guess I'm hosting you metaphorically. This is awesome. You're hosting us electronically. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. What? I don't know. I, how are you a metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're like right here in the room. You're stand, You're like across me. You're here. You in- means on his podcast. Oh, you are in right. charge. I knew of what this. you were saying, Alex. They're yeah. just not as, as sharp as they used to be. Yeah. I'm in <laughs> your state, your house. Yeah. I'm completely yeah. out of my element. It is our state. It's yeah. true. Yeah. I'm talking to the three mayors of the state of Oregon. Right now. <laughs> well, crazy town. It's an unincorporated yeah. uh, state of being. State of being. Well, in you the, guys aren't the, the mayors of, of crazy town by any means. You're the three curmudgeons on the outskirts. Well, we're right. the only residents of crazy town, I guess. <laughs> no, there's so many people in crazy That's, town. Well, I they think. come and visit. Yeah. Least, yeah. You got all the behind the scenes people making it happen, too. That's true. Driving yeah. their big Dodge trucks, shooting uh, oh, the leaf blowers. The inspiration. Oh, I thought you were talking more nicely about the people who help us put on <laughs> Crazy Town. Well, there's the there's the Crazy Town podcast, and then there's the proverbial Crazy, crazy town, town that yes. you're investigating. Yeah. So that's interesting. So are we investigating a Crazy Town, or are we inhabiting a state of being? Well, that was you the whole I mean? premise was that we live in crazy town because you see all the problems and all the things that are going wrong and the fixes are available, but nobody is talking about them. Nobody's really making it happen. 
Well, right. and in a way, you three are anthropologists. Yes. And you're documenting something. You're exoticizing something that is so familiar that people take it for granted. It makes it sound like more serious yes. and like yes. right. erudite. Thank and you. And no, it's true. Then, then it's true. Let me are. have a sip of my wine. Whether you uh, accept it or not, I see you as anthropologists. Thank and you. I Thank want you. to get really specific about what we mean by a lot of the terms that we're using. And so like, because... Words like capitalism and Western civilization or the United States of America, these are all just completely made up terms. We're just slapping on a very complicated reality. And so you're bringing to the conversation your own term. You have termed what I imagine to be somewhat analogous to our, our global civilization, industrial civilization as crazy town. And so I wanted to really talk with you about this town that you have encountered and you've talked a lot about and how you've broken it down. And first, what you mean by crazy, I see that you're not referring to people struggling with mental illness. You mean it's a, a perspective that is inherently unsustainable. Yeah. Um, the mentality of crazy town, you're not saying it's bad town or hurtful town. It, I see you using the word crazy because there is a, it seems like a delusional aspect to the mindset that people have that think that unlimited growth is reasonable, that we can be separate from the earth and try to conquer it, even though we're just one species that's dependent on it. Right. And it's almost like you're trying to catalog what is this place that we all exist in, what is the mindset of it, and that you see yourselves as kind of outside of that. But so if you could kind of describe to me, like, take me on a tour of crazy town to someone who has never viewed the world this way, like what would you describe as the mentality of this mm. strange place? What's the culture there? Yeah. I wonder if it'd be actually interesting to use our Marvin Harris lens okay. to describe Crazy Town a little bit. Um, yeah, and which is something think? that you, in your Crazy Town podcast in the most recent season, was yeah. a very effective kind of three-step process to understanding. Oh, yeah. So wait, let's maybe start with structure. And then the main thing we talk about first, maybe I can do structure. And then well, give us well, what's the overview of the Marvin yeah. Harris oh, yeah. okay, uh, so, cultural materialism? Yeah. So an anthropologist that basically... A real anthropologist. A real right. anthropologist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he, a uh, very famous anthropologist. And he basically said that the societies develop, they evolve based upon the material conditions of their existence. So what is their means of subsistence? And that means of subsistence, the basic material side is called the infrastructure. And then a particular infrastructure will lead to the requirements for social norms and laws that we would call structure. So for example, if you have an industrial food system, you're going to have to have food safety inspectors and regulators who make sure that things are labeled properly in packages and there's cooling that's properly done for transport. They have industry standards like that level of complexity requires then organization, bureaucracy, laws, norms. And then above that was what we call the superstructure. And this would be then the mythologies and general belief systems. So the idea like the progress myth would be a superstructure that comes from, if you back it up, the infrastructure that I'll focus on now, we also call high energy modernity or the idea that Every individual in an advanced industrial society has access to fossil fuels. And it gives you superpowers too, exactly. right? Like uh, you can whip across the landscape in a car or in a plane or a yeah. train or whatever. You can fly at the speed of sound comfortably. Yeah, we right. can broadcast this episode uh, all over the world. But what's crazy about it is we use that bounty for all these dumb things. <laughs> There's so much waste in the system, hmm. right? We talk about this all the time, you know, the two-stroke engines that were surrounded by, you know, basically people blowing leaves from one spot to another spot. Don't get me started on leaf blowers. <laughs> it's yeah. like... Don't get me started on So leaf that blowers. we could clear yeah. off, you know, leaves oh from trees God. from our lawn that shouldn't exist. This is all the infrastructure of Crazy yeah. Town that you're talking about. These are all the, the things that are at our disposal. Yes. The material And the, the crazy... So there's parts of it that are mer truly miraculous, right? That have led us to... It's not Modern just... Modern medicine. Yeah, yeah. We're not necessarily using most of that bounty to really benefit people. There's a disproportionately small number of people who are benefiting you know, the most from it, right? right? It's not being shared equally among the population. And we are frivolous in right. how we use it because we were born into it and think... This is how it is. Well, this see, is the normal state of affairs. I think you're getting to the worldview, the superstructure yeah. space. But I think we got to take that pit stop at structure because you just outlaid all this stuff that came about from fossil fuels or even the stuff before that. But 
as the industrial revolution was getting going, you also had kind of an economics revolution. Right. And the whole idea of Adam Smith and capitalism and basically everybody follow your own individual self-directed path and it's going to form kind of the utopian society. Right. Individualism will lead to utopia. Yeah. Right. So you have all these policies about individualism, like individual property rights. And, you know, Cher, you're lamenting somebody grabbing a blower or maybe the, maybe picture this. So you got a big black Dodge pickup truck running diesel and the fumes are coming out the back and there's 12 guys standing in the bed with blowers, you know, just for whatever reason, just going down the street, running their blowers. That's completely legal and completely fine. You know, it's a, it, so our, this idea of you can do what you want individually within this economy, as long as you have the funds to make it happen goes so hand in hand with this blown up infrastructure of high energy modernity to make quite literally pave the roads for for us to do whatever it is we but, want. But that's the key thing. This is why infrastructure is so important because if the infrastructure w- didn't allow that to happen, it wouldn't matter that we had those those freedoms, right? One comes in a sense from the other. Well, that's one of the big things in Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, which in the first season we explored a lot. Is it really focuses on like the mindset of our culture which in this Marvin Harris uh, perspective would be the superstructure. Right. Yeah. And the fact that we believe that the world belongs to us means that we're creating a world where we're trying to enact that story. Yes, exactly. But you guys are bringing up the point that then it's, it is kind of like a feedback loop right. because yeah. we've created a society that's enacting the story that the world belongs to us. But then we're also kind of seeing the evidence of, well, it kind of looks like the world Right. It does belong to us because I have my nice manicured lawn. The river flowing through my city is covered in concrete. Yeah, it's all managed for us. Yeah. Right. So in this most recent season of Crazy Town, you have a great way of structuring all these episodes and describing the different components of Crazy Town. And you organize them based on infrastructure, structure, and superstructure. You list about how many? Nine, a dozen isms yeah. that are making up crazy town and i think there was just like a really great way of focusing on specific yeah, systems that are, yeah there's the infrastructure isms like industrialism consumerism urbanism technologyism technologicalism oh, i don't yeah. know how to pronounce that something like that <laughs> globalism then there's the structure isms growthism capitalism imperialism and then the superstructure isms individualism homocentrism extremism and otherism and i kind of wanted to like use that as the model to maybe go through some of these as well because i you bring up a lot of really interesting things in each episode like for the god i hope i remember (laughs) well then this helped me in the urbanism episode you bring up the point that there's more at this point in history anthropogenic mass than biomass yeah this killed me which can you explain what you mean by that oh okay so anthropogenic mass is stuff that people basically make for themselves most of it ends up being actually like stuff that we manufacture. So concrete, steel, glass, plastic. These are things not really found much in nature, right? And we've extracted raw materials, manipulated them through an industrial manufacturing process, and then deployed them for our quote unquote infrastructure needs. And now all that added up weighs more than all the living biomass on the planet. So all the trees, the phytoplankton in the ocean, the fish in the sea, blah, blah, blah. It, it, that's what ast- that's just astonishing to me. So um, if you took like a, a well, giant scale. cosmic yeah. scale in yes. space and you piled up all the concrete and plastic, yeah. that would now weigh more than all of the living beings. And-, and, and the key thing is in that how short of a period we're talking about. Right. This all having occurred. In. Yeah, because the bulk of that really is the concrete and asphalt and the yeah, the, the hardscapes that we've made. And yeah. that's a few hundred years. Yeah. Well, and I, actually, you think about doubling time. So, you know, economic growth. So since I was born 55 years ago, that probably has gone from maybe like we're a third of the biomass to now we exceed it. And that's what's astonishing. Well, and the, the other side is happening at the same time. The right. biomass it's has declining. been getting uh, hammered along the way as we replace it with our oh. stuff. I think in that urbanism episode, I was talking about how I was at a friend's place who lived in a high-rise building in downtown Portland, and we're up on the rooftop kind of terrace looking out over the city. And I was just having one of those moments of, wow, look at the amount of pavement and stuff 
and all the people just moving through it and and not what, freaking out. And what are we doing? Yeah, I didn't yeah. jump. Yeah, it was amazing. No, but the people down there aren't freaking out. Yeah. Right. No, and like- it's also like, my understanding is that it's not just that you guys don't like pavement because pavement scrapes your knees when you fall <laughs> off your skateboard. It's right. that you're seeing what's so dangerous about Crazy Town isn't also just what we've destroyed and what we've lost, but you're looking into the future and the trajectory yeah. Yeah. of this place and the mindset that enables it and the systems that are perpetuating it seems to uh, not be going to a place that you think is that... Uh, no, it's scary. Yeah, it... it and so let's talk a little bit... It's It will collapse and... When it, it comes down to scale, right? Like the, you could have some pavement. Like I love riding bikes. I love a good bike path. Uh, but when you have super highways and then more super highways and more, it's the doubling time, the exponential growth that's the problem. It's If we had a win to stop rule or a, a little bit of a ability to limit our own uh, desires for power, uh, then I think we'd, we'd be okay with some of this technology. So describe the great unraveling. That seems to be a key component. Have you read the news? <laughs> <laughs> seems like everything's going really well, and we're on top of it. And uh... yeah, so the great unraveling is actually a term that was coined by Joanna Macy, who I think your listeners would really appreciate a lot. And Joanna is, I think, ninety-five years old now, or close to it. Has been presidential aged. <laughs> she's been i guess you can call an eco philosopher for a long time and has helped a lot of people try to navigate emotionally psychologically you know with their whole selves kind of the state of the world in a sense it probably is a healthier response to living in crazy town than our response <laughs> our response is like pulling our hair out you know gnashing our teeth uh laughing i think joanna has come to this kind of similar perspective with a lot more heart and maybe compassion than I would than I have, I guess, in my in my life. But yeah, she's like she's like monk like, whereas we're we're, we're Grinch like with yeah. our blackened <laughs> little old shriveled hearts. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, it takes all kinds in yeah. this yeah. world, right? Yeah. Uh, in any case, she, you know, she coined this term, the Great Unraveling, which is actually part of a larger story that she has of a great turning, and the unraveling is basically a phase, a part of the undoing of what is now for something new to emerge that is much healthier and more sustainable and more just. And this is what we do. This is what we do at Crazy Town and probably what we do at Post Government Institute for good or bad. I think we sometimes lean a little bit into trying to help people stay in the moment of what we're actually grappling with because the tendency that I think so many of us have and I have is either we compartmentalize, we catastrophize in the sense of we're like, it's all fucked, forget it, right? Or we solutionize and we think, okay, this is going to get solved somehow or whatever. And we don't stay in that space of like, because it's frankly, it's hard, you know, looking out over from the rooftop at a scene where for most people looks like this is normal. Oh, the beautiful This is light. normal. Yeah. You know what I mean? And for us, it's like, what have we done what did this land look like before yeah. we paved the mm-hmm. shit out of it? And what is it going to look like when the fuels run out and like yeah. you know, whatever? So we're we're in that place. And I think because mm-hmm. people have such a hard time staying with it, mm-hmm. we've kind of leaned into and called the phase of this collapse, the great unraveling, which is just naming what we're experiencing already, right? So, and bringing it back to the Marvin Harris stuff and infrastructure, whatever, it's likely going to be that our behaviors change the rules that we set up, our belief systems at a large scale are going to change because we're forced to change. And that's in some ways an infrastructural change. And that may be driven because we can no longer ignore the hurricanes, the heat waves, the droughts, the floods, the whatever, mm-hmm. which is the the climate you know consequences of what we've been doing or it's something else. But there's an unraveling that's already happening. It's not equally distributed around the world. It's manifesting itself in different ways because what happens is it sort of plays on the dynamics that already exist. So you have a crisis that happens and it just feeds, you know, these underlying things that maybe have been covered up for a long time, like racial ethnic tensions or other kinds of things that are social dynamics, exposes corruption. It creates opportunities for people who want to consolidate power to do so. You know, it's like- Weakens democratic institutions yeah. where there's a need for more drastic action. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think what happens, so 
There's social unraveling, and I think we see lots of signs of, of that around us. You know, you're talking about democratic institutions, this political polarization that we're seeing. We're seeing dynamics even in terms of the impacts of technology. God knows what will happen with AI, for example, in terms of, you know, what it does to labor markets and those kinds of things. And then you have all these environmental unravelings that are happening. And it, it's kind of that that multiplicity of crises coming together, which some people call a polycrisis, that we're experiencing. And we have to somehow chart a path forward in a way where we recognize that our options are limited, and they're not just limited politically in a certain way, but they're limited infrastructurally, biophysically, right? right? And that's part of our criticism of people who just believe all we need to do is ramp up renewables and we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But we have to navigate it as things are getting worse. And that's what's so difficult. And you have to live with the tons of uncertainty. Like this yeah. is a thing, it's like the solutionism or avoidance. It's comfortable to have either an answer or just to be able to ignore. But to know that you're probably never going to be comfortable with a, a full understanding, with a comprehensive knowledge of what your best role is, how to apply yourself in this, because the situations are dynamic. They're kind of unprecedented in your lifetime. What should you do? What's the best thing I can do? You're probably going to be challenging yourself with that all the time. A lot of it is living, you know, trying to be comfortable in a state of unknowing and uncertainty. One of the amazing things I've noticed in, in the years of doing this podcast and studying all these issues around uh, the great unraveling is that I can pretty clearly see where I'm compartmentalizing. And then that puts you in a pretty strange mental space. So I think it's it's the same thing. Like you're talking about the uh, discomfort of uncertainty. There's also the discomfort of being a hypocrite. That, yeah, right. That exactly. I think we have to deal with because that's a really tough. Yeah, place how do to you live. both be com how do you both be complicit and then also do something that is maybe compensatory in some way <laughs> and is looking towards the future? And it's it's almost impossible not to be complicit while you're also working on. I don't know if you call it solution, but we would more talk talk about like response or adaptation as opposed to solution, because there's no solution. A solution is you can identify a goal that's clear and you can do something relatively straightforward to address it. But in these kind of polycrisis unraveling situations, we're dealing with whole systems that are kind of collapsing and, re and trying to reorganize, there's no simple path like that. And mm -hmm. that's really hard to manage, especially as an individual when you're dealing with you know, the madness of crowds and mob mentality and uh, asymmetrical power. And so you, you can quickly feel helpless. And that's what you know we struggle with all the time. How do you have some sense of agency and purpose in life? And I imagine the way that you guys relate to crazy town, the, the global civilizational crazy town that you're describing is similar to how I felt when I was 16 studying for the SATs. Mm. And I was, you know, I, I did the SATs once. I got a pretty low score. My mom was like, okay, oh, this no. is like not going to be good. <laughs> um, and so... She put me in this class I had to do after school, and they were really upfront about it, though. There was this Russian lady. She was teaching us, this is like how you're going to get a better SAT score. It wasn't about like, this is how you're going to learn more. This is not about being more of a critical thinker. This is just how we're going to like raise yeah. the numbers. In so this course. is for the people that weren't rich enough to hire somebody to take the SAT for their kids. Is that right? <laughs> that would have be been amazing. <laughs> that would have been great. I would have learned so much <laughs> yeah, exactly. through that method. But so I, you know, is the night before the SATs and... I was just so viscerally upset by not just this test, but also just the whole school system, you know, like right. spending, here I was wasting away my childhood indoors doing bullshit 10% of the time I was learning. Yeah. And I could have learned that in way more effective ways than having to go home and do homework and just felt like, you know, this is to me such a bizarre, ridiculous yeah. thing that I'm wasting my life doing. And just because Everyone does it, and my parents did it, and my grandparents did it, and my great grandparents did it, and also like we talk about how it's a societal good, you know. And I just felt like this very normal, mundane, everyday thing to me was was very obviously crazy. Yeah, it's like a trap. You feel like you're trapped. Yeah, and it's so it's what you guys are doing with Crazy Town, and why I'm calling you anthropologists, trying to exoticize you know our own culture and take away the normal aspects of it it's it is this upsetting thing because like we're witnessing the destruction of the world but it's like well yeah i mean this is what humans do this is what 
advanced countries do and the countries that aren't are poor like need to jump onto this so they can embody what we're doing you're gonna break a few eggs right crack a few eggs make an omelet and so what you do with this most recent season is you talk about escaping from crazy town and you know like with the all the different infrastructure structure superstructure stuff we talked about each episode is structured by escaping industrialism, escaping consumerism, escaping growthism, escaping capitalism. And I found, I noticed, guys, that it was much easier for you to talk yeah. about how shitty these things are yeah. <laughs> yeah. than it was to imagine uh, how we could escape from them. I know. I'm sorry, everybody. The, <laughs> well, here, I mean, here's part of the challenge that we have that we have to be honest about, which is it has to do with agency and scale on some level. So we don't have the agency, the capacity to change the global economic system to stop externalizing, you know, environmental impacts or to basically halt, you know, speed trading or whatever, you know, kind of structural changes we might, if we could, you know, snap our fingers. And Out act, right? leaf blowers. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right. so we don't have the agency ourselves to do that. What do we have the agency to do? It's much more at a local and personal kind of scale, which also is not sufficient to in and of itself, change the entire trajectory of the system. So we're still caught in the system. Right. And when I think the most uh, important insights at the beginning of the journey is to recognize, like, we're not just taking up a summer residency at Crazy Town. We're actually, like, yeah. held captive yes. here. Right. We are captive. And all of these things, like industrialism, capitalism, consumerism, what's so strange, and you talk about this in the podcast, we're held captive, and there's so many ways that these systems are hurting us, but it's also enabling us to live our lives depend on these systems too yeah and so it's what i think is so hard yeah for i mean you talked about rob as compartmentalization i think people manifest this in different ways but it is exceedingly difficult to go day to day in a very conscious way living in a world that you know is pathological or you fundamentally disagree with but you have to still participate in it and literally have to participate in it in order for your your existence. Mm -hmm. And so holding both of those things, doing both of those things simultaneously is incredibly challenging, which is why I think it's very difficult for people to sort of be there, right? Be in that space between. I completely get why most people never never even have the reckoning like you were having in school. You know, being aware that the school system is kind of totally flawed, bullshit thing. He's your buddy. He's not the same. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, I I basically dropped out. Rob and I love school. school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We were were good little students. I mean, I was biased because I was a very bad student. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I did not do well at the test. Same thing. That's amazing, actually, (laughs) Jason, that we're in this uh, room discussing the things that we discuss because we were such rule followers. Uh, Yeah, we were good at following rules. (laughs) I came to follow rules later. But uh, (laughs) what's challenging about trying to escape... For the audience that we have of people, at least what we're arguing for, people that maybe are like us, who are still in it, the simplest way to escape is literally just go off grid, you know? Yeah, but you probably you don't can. have any skills and you're probably going to be doing something illegal. Okay, but then you die and then right. whatever. Yeah, at least a great it's, a, it's resolved. <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah, yeah. It's an escape. Uh, right? Let's yeah. back it up. Death is your first and best escape. Well, is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I mean, this is the but challenge. The is that... podcast is not yeah. endorsed. Yeah. Yeah. Is <laughs> yeah. Trigger Nobody running. listened to anything we say, first Anyhow, of all. but this is the dilemma, right? Ishmael is a lot about you change your, change your internal story, right? Mm-hmm. And then talk to others about it and change their story. The issue becomes, okay, you have that new story, but the infrastructure doesn't support it. Right. And so if you want to then have some agency that is aligned with that new story, you run into one barrier after, the, after another. Oh, I want to become a more simple agriculturalist that also does some hunter-gathering on the side. It's going to be in a kind of what modern day we would call regenerative. Yeah, I, I was... want to do this communally so I have more of my own tribe, blah, blah, blah. How? Well, I was hunting and gathering at the Chase Bank, and they did not like that. I mean, I just had <laughs> wads of cash I was leaving You're hunting with. and gathering yeah. at the Whole Foods. The sign said free pens. Yeah. yeah. I don't know so, what look, so the structure is makes that illegal mostly, right? Unless you have enough money to buy land and now you have title. And so now you're part of the system in a sense of the property class. But okay, let's say you're a part of the property class like I am. And 
Must be nice. The landed gentry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But you're aligned Modern with Modern squire. Yeah. <laughs> now That's you, what that wig is for. In your closet. <laughs> I was wondering about that. We always A lot get, of powder. Yeah, we get ready with our powdered wigs here in Crazy Town. <laughs> yeah. so, so you're going to live with the contradiction, even in that situation. You make compromises the entire way. None of it's perfect. Like, there's no path to a quick utopia. So we're always going to live in this place of like, I'm not quite satisfied. I'm kind of disappointed, but I'm trying. And and you'll be ridiculed for it too. I want to get back to something you touched on, Jason. I feel like it's super important. And that is not going it alone. And I actually feel like that is the secret cheat code in a sense to navigating all this stuff, because trying to do this on your own is frankly impossible. You're still going to be locked in the system. You're still going to have to deal with all the dissonance, all the contradictions, all the hypocrisy, all the whatever, even if you're doing it with a group of people, unless you all completely drop out together. But trying to do it on your own, where you're not having conversations with people about the state of the world as you see it, people that you could work with to sort of take these baby steps to kind of like have one foot out, trying to do that by yourself, I think is just exceedingly difficult. Now, here's here's the problem. The problem is to get people to join you, it's kind of like you have to tell them, look, there's a there's a virus coming. It's going to be really bad. And uh, what you need to do is get pre-inoculated. You basically need to get it before everybody else, right? Mm-hmm. Do you want to get sick with me? You know, do you want to get ill with me right now? This is right a now? terrible pitch. Of shit. Yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of what the equivalent is. It's like... I feel bad for the people that I have converted to this crazy town view of the world, you know? Well, the the anti-crazy town view of the world. The crazy town podcast view of the crazy (laughs) town world. And and what I hear you saying is that it's like you're the pitch you're making to people is that like we are going to experience real significant shocks to the system and it's going to force us to have systemic change where we're more immediately getting our resources on a local level, perhaps. And so you're telling people, these are things that we want to anticipate. But even psychologically, Mm -hmm. to be able to let go. Like, if you're not already kind of turned on to this way of seeing the world, you don't have those crazy town glasses, you know? The crazy town podcast glasses that are anti the crazy town. It's really weird. (laughs) Thank you. That's right. Just trying to sort it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, It's not kind to do that to people, make them put them on, you know? It's like, uh, I guess maybe the... The Matrix is that well. Metaphor. So it's it's <laughs> funny you say that because I have a bullet point here on my my sheet I'm looking at about uh, that exact thing the the red pill option yeah. in the Matrix. I think that's something that's really interesting that has changed significantly since the Matrix came out. You know, 25 years ago. And Ishmael talks. It about was not 25 years ago. 1999. Wow. I'm so old. I was six years old. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, these guys were. Um, well, anyway. <laughs> uh, you go back and look at that movie and they have technologies that are antiquated in there now like his little discs that he's giving out that's some kind of drug or right. something yeah. probably probably phones that right. are like huge yeah. so ishmael you know which came out in 1992 talks about this phenomenon too where it's ishmael the telepathic gorilla yeah. is telling the narrator like i'm gonna open your eyes on certain things and you're gonna feel really lonely yeah kind of oh, that's yeah. the disclaimer going into yeah. it And what's interesting is that in the 90s and the 2000s, the world that I grew up in, like the mainstream was full of many people who were operating on this level of things are fine. And, you know, the great unraveling you're talking about hadn't really expanded to the point where it was like undeniable for masses of people. But I think in the last 30 years or 25 years, the mainstream that used to be so large and there was just this small fringe of people being like, um, excuse me, but, uh. I think there's some problems here. The fringe that was on the periphery is a completely different situation as the mainstream is kind of faded and almost has disappeared. Mm-hmm. And I see society mm-hmm. is just a bunch of fractions of fringe. Huh. And I think that's kind of like a really different phenomenon than the Matrix and Ishmael were contemplating. Yeah. And this you know, concept of red pilling, have you heard this term like yeah. used in like the alt-right sense? Yeah. Yes. It's like the idea that... I'm seeing the problems of society in a way that like most people don't see. And I'm going to like inform you and wake you up. That is not just from folks like us who see ecological crises is really concerning. It's that there's so many fringes that are not really on the fringe. And so now you guys are not alone in the fact that 
actually like most people in society i'd say i don't know but maybe i'm just talking to the, the people that see this are saying some level of like everything is wrong right. and actually like i know what is wrong so how do we address <laughs> this weird phenomenon now where crazy town is filled of all these fringes that are really upset with crazy town how do we know that our fringe view isn't just another one of these ridiculous fringe views that you know i uh, yeah well it's been revealed to me <laughs> <laughs> you went out into the into the woods and uh yes. you, oh, you found I, a yeah. an angel who gave you a book I've no been, the aliens told oh, me the aliens. Been hitting yeah. jason in the head with stone tablets for That'll weeks do it. now yeah. <laughs> That'll do he's it. having visions yeah. <laughs> He'll do I mean, it. it's all the psilocybin that you're yeah like, these lizard yeah. people i saw their eyes yeah. So. Just the way they blinked. Yeah. 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 Well, that I think that's been one of your points, Asher, about Crazy Town uh, and the Great Unraveling is as more crises come to bear and you get kind of uh, one thing after another, that over time that erodes your your ability to act cohesively and to act rationally. It kind of opens the door, and that's why we had the episode on extremism. It's like you have to watch out that you don't. I mean, you could do it yourself, people in your family, or the whole society can be devolving into extremism in response to the stresses and the pressures that are visiting us all the time with, you know, whether it's too much heat or flooding or you can't get a job or you, you can't make ends meet or drug addictions or whatever. But I think his question is, is sort of a, um, how do we know what we know? And how much confidence do we have that our version of the situation is more or less the, the truth. truth. Yeah. yeah. And that that's a tough one. And I'll give you uh 2 minutes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that one of the things that gives me some level of comfort in my view is that I come to it rather reluctantly. That's one thing. The other thing is that a lot of what I think is problematic is anyone who claims they have the answer or the solution. When you're dealing with an unraveling like this and the poly crisis and systemic crisis, you should run away fast from people that think they have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And we may come across as kind of know-it-alls in a sense, but a lot of what we know is that it's almost unknowable. <laughs> and so uh, honestly, like that's uncomfortable. So this is the time where you should actually try to get as comfortable you can with the uncomfortable. And so you list all these things, consumerism, capitalism industrialism, imperialism, and each episode is dedicated to how do we escape that phenomenon. Ultimately, you're trying to uh, imagine escaping from crazy town. And that's when you bring up the classic Bill Murray film, Groundhog Day. Yes, that basically has all the answers. <laughs> so why uh, is Groundhog Day a good metaphor for escaping from crazy town? Well, it's a great film. For one, but so you just wanted to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, just we like movies. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, it, you know, I think it was just instructive because it was interesting that that film resonates so much for so many people in the sense that it has like kind of a spiritual meaning or a philosophy to it. But it was really about the kind of the journey of this guy who was a selfish prick, you know, and living effectively 40 years of life of the same day over and over and over again before he finally broke the spell. And it was and kind you of- And you said 40 years because people have like- Calculated. Online, like calculated yeah. based on like yeah. how long it would have taken him to learn the piano and he stuff He went like through that. all these Saxophone, stages. Saxophone, ice sculpting. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. talked about it as kind of like stages of grief, you know, like he, he went through these stages where he like, he tried to kill himself in all kinds of ways. He's trying to escape, right? Yeah. He's trying to escape this fate. And so he of he waking got, up every morning and experiencing the same exact day same in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and yes. so he Puxitani. went through more and more outlandish ways of trying to kill himself, and nothing worked. He would wake up the next morning, you know, back in the same place. Is that, is that a real place, by the way? If you're yeah, from, yeah, it is. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, I'm just checking. You're from you're from there in that area. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, right. Philadelphia is somewhat close to Puxatawney. Thank you. Yes. Okay, that's what yeah, I wanted same, to know. Yeah, same okay, state. Continue. Yeah. Um, and the the groundhog's name really is Phil. Okay. Yeah. This is great. It's historically accurate then. Yeah, it is. A, it, well, it's a documentary. Everything was a documentary, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Uh, the the cameramen were with him for that entire ride. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, he he basically is also, there's this woman that he's there with, and he basically wants to bet her. And so he sets out to, like, 
try to figure out everything she loves and to master that thing, you know? So he, and this is where people start calculating, how long would it take him to perfect that? Because he learns how to play with the piano. He knows like, how to speak uh, like French. A, yeah. Yeah, all these things, basically, <laughs> just try to better. Then he spends time, like, trying to, I think he starts being more empathetic to the world, and he's like, rescuing people, you know, doing all these he things. He knows he's, when a little girl is going to, like, fall from a tree. He knows yeah. everything like that. that's happened, yeah. you know? Because it happens every day. He's every day, exactly the same time, the same way. So yeah. he just, like, intervenes that way. And eventually, it's about him kind of giving up himself, you know, hmm. in a sense. And we were using that as kind of an exploration into the whole recognition that the last thing to escape is the idea that we can escape effectively, you know. Mm. Um, mm. In all of the episodes, we've struggled in a sense, and we owned it, to point to really tangible ways of truly escaping that ism that we talked about. I think we can es- escape extremism. We may not escape it in terms of, like, it existing in the world, but we can try to escape it in ourselves. Like, there's some things we could escape consumerism or greatly reduce our participation in consumerism. We can't escape it as, as kind of the driver of the economy. But a lot of the isms you can't escape from. We can't escape from industrialism, you know, at this point. But even the idea of just escaping in general is, is something that we have to let go of because at least for, I think, for the choice that we're making and the, the choice that we're asking our listeners to make is to stay with the trouble, in a sense, to stay in mm. the game. If we can't escape Crazy Town, we're going to have to try to transform it. All of these isms we can't just push away from. We at least can validate other people who are speaking from this outsider perspective, just to remember, like, yeah, no, this is pretty ridiculous what we got going on yeah. here, right? This is pretty ridiculous. It seems to be one of the foundational things you're trying to do is to allow people to exist in this discomforting place. And to recognize this is ridiculous, here we are. I think if you take an ecological worldview in the sense that you recognize a web of life and our codependence in that web of life, there's a respect that occurs and a recognition that diversity out there is key actually for our own survival. And when we think about this unraveling and all the uncertainty that happens in it, I would say we want just a prodigious growth of all kinds of different experiments and different ways of people trying to navigate this because we don't know what works and different things will work for different people that generally prioritizes certain things, right? The well-being of life and respect and mutuality in that. People can go their different paths. They can experiment with different things. And even within the sphere of like the community, people who are trying to navigate crazy town, our approach to talking about this, to dealing with it, works for some people, it doesn't work for other people. There are others out there, thank God, in this ecosystem that take a much more maybe heart-centered... More mature. More mature, (laughs) maybe more more of a feminine perspective, you know, that's a lot more, frankly, kind and gentle than than our approach. (laughs) And I'm glad for those. Yeah, me too. Let me back you on, you said we need prodigious growth in experiments, ways of living. I totally agree if... You gotta tune it up a little. If that growth is infinite and exponential, <laughs> deal. Then, then we're then and we're I can figure good. out how to profit from it yeah. somehow. <laughs> well, I I actually brought you guys a little uh, gift for today. I thought would help our conversation. What? I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take it out here. It's a. Uh, it's not very big. A contraption. Oh. And uh, you can see it's yeah it's a little heavy. And I'll pass it around, and it's a it's a window into the future Mm. you can see i like i haven't been able to clean it for a long time so it's kind of it's kind of foggy a little dark and so you're not gonna be able to see like that broad is that just a magic eight ball or something what is that (laughs) no 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 don't ignore that that's for later Uh, (laughs) but um i'm gonna pass this around and i want you to look through it and maybe there's you know Mm. one or two things that you can see and this is a future that you look at and it's a future where Our society and multiple versions of our society, because it's a diverse future, have navigated responsibly and wisely the great unraveling and are living in a way that makes you think like, wow, all right. Okay, that's, thank God. So, Rob, I'll uh, pass it to you first. Oh, what's, what's one or two things that you see? Careful there. It's very yeah, fragile. That, that's heavy. That must be lead glass right there. <laughs> Gosh, to be put on the spot like this. If you want like a sort of a, this will be ironic, we'll call it a concrete thing because it's about removing the concrete. Yeah, what's something I've, maybe, yeah, this is, yeah. I guess, a, an infrastructure question as well. Too. Well, what's so I, that you see? I've just started uh, kind of 
hearing about and haven't done much looking into, but the idea of depaving, you know, trying to say like, okay, we've been on a paving binge for such a long time. How can we have a, a society that doesn't need that much pavement? Let's start having natural uh, well, what, you know, look, nature look through the again. mirror what do, what is what do you see <laughs> okay so so like I've, i talked about this actually not this season but like last season i biked down to corvallis from portland to record and there were parts of that bike ride that were just heinous you know i was like i felt like i was taking my life in my hands but there was a section south of salem where i'm riding these really small little trails through the woods by the water it was beautiful. And there were other people out on non-motorized vehicles, you know, making their trips and it's quiet. It was not, it was like, so in the realm of personal mobility, I know not everyone can jump on a bike and ride a a big distance, but uh, for people who can, it was a absolutely wonderful way to get here. And something that's required in our culture is that we accept the slowing down. It doesn't always have to be at speed. You know, you could take a day to go a hundred miles instead of having to do it in an hour and a half or whatever. Mm. And I, I could see us all breathing a little better and, and having a kind of a just happier, slower life in a sense, if we could just have that infrastructure where it was okay and have the culture where it was okay to just ride your bike. That's beautiful. You know, let's pass that, <laughs> get careful, careful, pass that over to Jason. Jason, what do you see in through the window, the foggy window of the future? Uh, I don't know if you want to hear anything I want to say. <laughs> There's a great fire and the <laughs> missiles are raining down. Yeah. That's the problem. I don't know if I have anything nice to say. Well, I've, it's not it doesn't it doesn't matter. I'm not asking you to make something up. What do you think this is? Just look through the mirror <laughs> shit. and see what's something. And it doesn't have to you don't have to tell me how they build it. What's the context of it? What's something that into this foggy window of the future that makes you think like, huh, I, man, I don't know how we're going to get to that, but thank God that they have that. There. Okay. Okay. Um, high in the Andes, um, there are people who made it through <laughs> <laughs> because it didn't get too hot and they were already, you know, they were already living pretty simple lives in community. So they had an intact culture. Um, oh, look, I see others high in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. Uh, where, yes, they have they have uh, a sustained society similar to what they had in the past, but with highly adjusted ecosystems. Mm. Um, boy, elsewhere, it's been tough because the infrastructure never adapted to the rapid change that happened in climate and the decline of complexity. And these vast urban landscapes are just kind of wastelands. And there are some people who make trips to them and find, you know, pieces of steel, et cetera, and concrete that they use for helping build new settlements that are in remnant pockets of good water and good soil, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's not a very nice vision, but that's kind of like what I see right now because we aren't really doing anything that would stray from that path, honestly, mm-hmm. at the moment. Fair enough. Well, thank you for looking through the mirror. Let's pass it over to a, a Sharon to see what... It's funny because I'm not I'm not typically viewed as the, the uh, optimist, <laughs> the cheery, you know... You're going to seem like one now. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for lowering the bar so so yeah. much. For yeah. Me. Hey, there's yeah. still people in the Andes. I see three people in the future. Remember that scene in Terminator? They're where all Sarah related Connor... to each other, but they still need to procreate. It's kind of <laughs> awkward. No. Um, when I take a super long view, and this, this is definitely my bias of like what I think I'm enamored with, or what I love to envision, and that is a world of just vibrant life of diverse life everywhere. And like I sort of picture, and I'm talking about a thousand plus years hence, you know, I take yeah, a, no, it's a long good view. It's and, a good window. You know, where there's kind of what, what Jason was talking about. There, there are myths, mythologies and stories, you know, that, that have been shared about the remnants. And I could see that the, maybe there are vision quests that happen or journeys that are taken for people going through rites of passages where they're taken to the, 
the it's not going to be Vegas because that's going to be you know whatever impossible, but maybe a northern <laughs> climate city, you know, Seattle, Quebec, or yeah. you know whatever where. They, they go and see the remnants, and it's a precautionary tale. It's a precautionary experience for them because mm-hmm. the stories that are told is not, not about the greatness of those past societies. It's about their folly, right? Um, and that's part of what's embedded in them. But that there's just vibrant life and that there are kids who are finding incredible joy spending a lot of free time out in nature with one another and meeting up. And maybe there are these regular annual gatherings that happen in centralized places, but they haven't seen each other in a year. There's a great celebration there, you know, down the road, far down the road, you know, in the near term, it's like, can we have dentistry? Is there a way? (laughs) Yeah. Like that would be a win. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If we still had like a way that people could get inoculated for just basic shit, we had something like antibiotics and uh, does, there was does the main uh, dental tool being a cinder block is that still dentistry? It's, it's an ice skate, you know, from uh, the cast castaway uh, yeah. film. Well, and also this is something I want to help clarify. What you're saying is a good way to clarify your guys's position on Crazy Town because you're not necessarily like trying to have us return to. And you talk about this like you're not just luddites. You're not anti technology. In fact, like you're very concerned that our irresponsible use of technology is going to make it impossible for future generations to enjoy the positive aspects of technology. Exactly. Oh, okay, great. That's the thing. We underestimate the resilience of the human's ability to adapt. Now, we're doing shit to the planet that may be just beyond. You you know how much microplastic is in your brain right now? Sure. The synapses can't, the, 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 the neurotransmitters can't cross that gap anymore. There are people who've gone through unbelievable traumas and they have persisted, you know. So as long as the rate of change, which is not a guarantee, isn't so fast that we can't adapt, I think we all care deeply. I think there's actually a lot of pain in all of us, and we cope with it in different ways. And sometimes that's just getting our hands dirty. Sometimes it's us laughing at the darkness, watching 80s movies, you know, <laughs> listening to music, exercising, whatever. Like, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing yeah. to compartmentalize, if we want to call it that, or to yeah. care for ourselves. In yeah. you know. It is a common thread among people in our movement. And I think it's, if you really want to get down to it, I think it, the deep care is, is there. But it's also love, right? It's a love yeah. for what we were gifted, the world we came into. But then in experiencing that, you, you love the people that you're with, too. And I, I do think you find you love the, the place that you are and, and what's being lost and you want to have a life of meaning trying to make it work and trying to, to do it better and you find people that, that you love that you can do that with and I think that's uh, you know whatever that's kind of the recipe <laughs> the key word to me in what you just said was movement and and I want to differentiate between people who are part of this community who are part of the movement and people who are not, because movement implies that there's some kind of action happening, right? And I think that there are people who have come to maybe a similar diagnosis of what we're what we're seeing, and they're not part of a movement. They have resigned themselves. Maybe it's a defense mechanism because they're scared to have any hope or invest in anything when they feel like, God, everything is against us and there's no way we're going to have a better outcome. And so they become resigned and fatalistic and curmudgeon and just locked in a place of basically looking at everything and shitting on it, you know? And we do our fair share of shitting on things. We are trying and engaged in trying to move things on some level. It's not a movement towards a utopia, mm. but it's a movement towards something, mm. you know? And, and I would say the people that we have been lucky enough to get to know, these podcasts have been cathartic for me in a lot of ways. And I feel lucky to have the opportunity to have these kinds of conversations and have the relationships with these two guys, but also to meet people like you, Alex, and all these other people I've gotten to meet is the best part of the work that I get to do. And it's because there's a characteristic of people who are trying to stay in this space. That's a really hard place to stay in and move it towards something without being Pollyannish or oversimplistic about what it is we can achieve, you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. And I, I love those people because there's a humility, I think, to them and a love that they carry, you know? Mm-hmm. That's beautiful, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for hosting and yeah. yeah, and for the work you're doing. 
Thank yep. you for hosting me so I can host you. <laughs> nice going. Thanks for listening. And thank you to Jason, Rob, and Asher for joining us today. You can listen to the Crazy Town podcast on all podcast platforms and learn more about the work they do at resilience.org. I'll include all the good links in the show notes. Until next time, I hope you'll consider how you might bring some sanity to Crazy Town and endure and adapt to the great unraveling. I'd love to hear what you think, so feel free to reach out and leave a comment on our Patreon. And speaking of our Patreon, that's where you'll find the full two-hour extended conversation with the Crazy Town guys. That's right, there's a whole other hour of insights and silliness. On the Human Nature Odyssey Patreon, you'll also find audio extras, transcripts of episodes, and some audiobook readings of books that have influenced the show. By joining our Patreon, you will also help keep the Odyssey going far into the future. Your support makes this podcast possible. This was the third of three Summer Conversation episodes. Next month, on September 19th, we'll usher in autumn with Season 2 of Human Nature Odyssey. The first episode of Season 2 will continue the theme started today of escaping society by exploring the story of Christopher McCandless and Into the Wild. Make sure to subscribe wherever you enjoy your podcasts to be the first to hear next month's episode. And as always, our theme music is Celestial Soda Pop by Ray Lynch. You can find a link in our show notes. Okay. Talk with you soon.